I'm not um, patient. What the fuck is? Hey, Brian. Ryan. Cool. Ryan, you need to. You need to just. <laughs> This is a song you should like. Listen to this. Listen to this song. It sounds more exciting than what it is. Let's see how we can lose our next three listeners. Can I tell my goddamn story? Let's, let's try to work on our, our people. Can I tell my goddamn story? Yeah, what are we talking about again? Come on, Ryan. Can I tell my goddamn story? Me, Dave, in the house. Test schools, test schools, test schools, one, two, one, two, welcome, you're in the meantime with me and Dave, uh, hello, this is episode, shit, what are we at, 31? Yeah, it's episode 31, uh, this week, that was fuck kind of title, you know what, someone pissed me off earlier and I was ta- uh, not like in a real way, but, uh, well, well it was over a Facebook dispute over, uh, whatever, I don't even want to give this, give, uh, the person I was arguing with was a complete stranger. Uh, the person whose thread it was on was on a, I don't even know why I'm still following the fan page of somebody that I know, uh, who has only got one, like, he's got a credit he's been milking for fucking two years and never even took full advantage of it, and, and, uh, somehow, you know, I followed the fan page when he had no credit, which means that it's just gonna leave you alone, and then now he has, like, you know, a few hundred to maybe a thousand or whatever people, um, yeah, so I'm, I, I, whatever, I'm not even in an argument with him, I'm having a fun dispute with him over one particular movie, and that is Spider-Man Far From Home, which is, it's not a great movie, it's still a fun movie, it's a good movie, it's a good follow-up to the, to the heaviness of Endgame and, and Infinity War and all that, uh, so we're gonna call this one episode 31, um, Stuck at Home, yeah, there you go, it's just stuck at home, still, coronavirus, uh, Ron- the, the, the Rona logs, weeks, I believe we're at like 13 and 14 now, uh, since all of this uh, shelter in place shit. Um, things are going well, uh, you know, things are, things are actually not going well, things are actually falling apart, but they're going well in spite of them falling apart, that's the good thing, people are really, they're freaking out, and yet still kind of holding their shit together in a sense, because the, the, you know, testing's more widespread, so now people, there's a lot more cases, um, the, you know, there's deaths, well, there's always gonna be deaths, um, you know, uh, it, it's just, it's one of these things, things are opening up, but they're not, there's, eh, eh, fucking whatever, all the, all this, play, it, it, people are just dumb, quite frankly, you know, I wear my mask, I don't even, you know, I don't even argue about it, I don't have any fucking problems with the stupid masks, um, anyway, so, uh, but this week we're gonna do something different, uh, we're going to, uh, have, uh, more of a podcasty, uh, I'm having my friend, comedian, friend Jonathan Ott, uh, he's going to join me, and we're going to sort of test the waters uh, via Zoom, doing a Zoom podcast of sorts that we may spin off into another podcast of sorts uh, when this all goes back to whatever the fuck, because uh, he's a good friend, I like having a good excuse to bullshit with him, and uh, we'll just see if it's anything that is worth listening to, so you'll, you'll, you're getting the initial scoop of me bullshitting with my buddy John, uh, but beyond that, we got some checking ins also as well, uh, first let's check in with, uh, Andy Kettel, Kettle, Andy Kettle, um, and, uh, yeah, here, here's that. I'm getting my hair cut tomorrow, Dave. My barber of the last seven or eight years retired because of the coronavirus, so I'm going to a new guy. Kind of nervous to see how it's going to turn out, but it couldn't look worse than this. Stay tuned. Okay, so uh, you know, hair, hair has been a big deal. He also sent me this. This was his uh, his, which we'll call it the letter from Dick the barber, his barber of uh, seven to eight years. Um, so we had we had a little heart to heart about that, you know, because he was kind of sad over uh, Dick not being able to cut his hair, but. Um, hopefully we'll get the follow-up to that by the time I'm done recording this. We won't know. Um, it all depends on the editing, all that shit. Well, it wasn't exactly what I wanted, but it'll do. Good job, Earl. Also, hey, here's a trailer. Uh, not a trailer, I'm sorry. This is a PSA. I made a PSA 
for I'm doing an event this week. Uh, I'm, I'm doing a few shows this week, actually. I mean, we've been doing the comedy drive-in for the last month. Uh, this Saturday will be the last one of June. We may continue it, uh, but it won't be like every single weekend. It's gonna we'll be spreading out the love, but uh, but they've been really successful and a lot of fun. So uh, if anybody watches these, actually goes to the comedy drive-in. Thank you for for participating in that. Um, but also, like uh, we're doing our usual Thursday. Uh, comedian show and tell. It's the LGBTQ themed episode this week. We've got uh, our guests, me and, me and Nina G, got our guests uh, Wonder Dave, uh, Adriana McCain, and Mona Lot. That's right, it's Nina's friend Mona Lot. And uh, and then after, and then Friday, me, both me, Nina G, and myself are uh, we're both performing. On the Il Parada Zoom comedy show with host Tony Sparks, uh, produced by uh, local folks, uh, which is Kiko Breeze, an old friend, and a damn good guy, and we're looking forward to that show. And then Saturday, before the drive-in show, I am also hosting an online event for the band Mordred, uh, which uh, if you've, you've probably not heard of Mordred unless you're a metalhead going back to the 90s. Mordred was a band that I knew of when I was 12, 13 years old. Uh, they had a video on Headbangers Ball. They were a thrash band, one of the only thrash bands that had a, a DJ. His name's DJ Pause. And this is long, this isn't like the rap metal thing. They were a, they were a thrash band. But they were, the only, they were a thrash band that thought, you know what? You know, rap's popular and stuff. Let's try experimenting with the DJ, the scratching DJ. And they got one. His name is DJ Paws. He's a great DJ, cool dude. I just met him this weekend, and um, but they invited me to uh, host and participate in writing and doing some sketches for an online event they're doing uh, this Saturday at on, uh, on June 27th at 3 p.m. Pacific time. Um, that because they got fans in Europe and all over, and um, but this was a band that I hadn't thought of since I was 12 years old. And um, and they were ahead of their time in the sense of you know like the what became the new metal bands and they, they aren't a new metal band they're a thrash band with a DJ but the bands since when you had you know uh, some people you know look at Anthrax and Public Enemy doing something as part of it nah it's not really Biohazard was the one band the first band that really incorporated the rap kind of rhythm to the the, the crunch and tone of guitars. And uh, and really kind of and would kind of almost wrap their lyrics. They were bought, they were a New York hardcore group, but then they started kind of making it catchier. Plus, they were friends with rap groups. They're well known for being good friends with Onyx, also from New York. But it was starting the beginning of this uh, rap and metal have always gotten along because they were extremes. Um, you know, rap, metal heads like rap, and, and not all of them, but I'm just saying there were there were people that got into it. They both were uh, dealing with uh, you know meager means and stuff like that, and dealing with uh, you know contemporary issues. And I grew up during the the I want to say the the heart of all that. But then after that came along the fusion of the two, which I am not a fan of at all. Never have been really. Uh, and those are the new metal bands, and there's a whole generation of and I'm friends with people that are, I mean, there's a whole generation that grew up on that. The way I, I was a child that, that during the grunge era, um, these were people that grew up during the new metal era. So they grew up with bands like Korn, uh, Deftones, uh, Linkin Park. Uh, I think you see where this is going. You know, Limp Bizkit being the worst of them all and the most popular. Um, and, uh, and they basically would dumb it down. It would be dumbed down metal tones and just just real stupid that's really what i just kind of got from it and then there's tone there's some of it that would creep into the actual metal you get a lot of jock attitudes you get a lot of these tough guys you know and then it gets into like the mma type fucking metal and that's eh, not i don't dig that shit um i liked it because it was made by generally crazy people um or people that were very talented uh, that also knew how to express craziness through their talent. Um, but also were just good music, you know, they're just cool dudes. My favorite band's the Melvins. Anybody who knows me knows my favorite band's the Melvins. And those guys make some way out there music, and they're just working dudes who, uh, who love to make music. That's how I look at comedy. I like to make comedy that depicts some kind of craziness that's part there, but not really, because it's entertainment. It's all bullshit. 
Um, anyway, so off on a tangent. Uh, point being, uh, I'm hosting for more dread on this streaming show. This is weird. I just again, I I, I got put through uh, in contact with them through uh, uh, again. Guess what? A friend who played drums in some of those new metal bands that. Yeah, he got some success, but you know, it's still, I mean, he still paints houses, nothing against him. Love the guy, works hard, not knock against him, it's just reality. Uh, but I hated new Metal, and I hated his bands. Not hated, hate strong, but I just never thought his bands were any good. Uh, when I heard, I never heard much of them, but what I heard, I, I had no, no, in, no interest in the genre. And he played drums for these bands during the height of that. That's my friend Sean Boyles. I've made fun of him on this show before. Um, but yeah, and he's... He Sean's been a real a real treat to watch uh, and really not watch during the uh, during the shelter in place because this entire time he uh, he's main you know this is a time when we're stuck at home um, you know we don't have any uh, we don't have means uh, of really you know we don't to like express ourselves really doing public shows and all that kind of stuff yet the entire time that I've been doing stand-up comedy in 10 years, I've watched all of these wannabes make nothing but a ton of un un unwatchable and unlistenable content constantly. I'm part of it, too, with this show, but I, I do make this for myself, primarily, and I hope other, and if I like it, I hope others do, too, and that's kind of how it works, and for the most part, they do. Um, the one, what small, uh, it's smart audience I, I appeal to, but uh, Sean, uh, he used to put out these these uh, Facebook lives on Sunday nights where he was just talking just as I'm talking to the camera with not even the set dressing. It was just his face like this, just in, just right there. And uh, just this big ass fucking head on the Facebook live. And he would talk for about a half hour or an hour um, to nobody. It would be like maybe anywhere from like one to six people that would chime in, which is fine for Facebook live. I have no, even no problem that he would do that. I would chime in every now and then just be like, oh great, your face is on here fucking up my, my news feed. But um, it's on, the folks? fact that then when this shit hit, he spun it into a podcast too, by the way. It's this awful podcast, the Sean Boyle's podcast. The, the, the logo says it all, the, the graphic and all that. Um, but when he, uh, when this single thing started, I invite, we started doing our, our Zoom show, the Another Terrible Podcast by Comics in Isolation. And he was one of the guys I invited to, to be on early on because I was like, hey, let's, I said, I know you got an audience. The fact is, he's got a lot of people that would probably watch his bullshit if he put it online. They, and I've talked to his friends. Some of them don't even think he's that good at, at comedy and whatnot. And they would still watch it because they're his friends and all that. I, I count on that kind of support, too, myself. But at the same time, he, and he can be funny. Don't get me wrong. I've seen him be funny. It's just not often. That's all. But um, but he... he ends up, uh, I, I ask him, and he goes, yeah, I'm not really into this Zoom, this, or I'm hearing about this Zoom bullshit, and da, da, da. total closed mind, which is in fitting with, you know, when I, when I think, I've, I've run into this before, especially from metalheads that were like, you know, uh, from, of the, like, 80s to 90s, there is this, there's this men, fucking attitude that I've run across in, in a lot of the metalhead community of, like, instant closed-mindedness. In, and at anything, it just you you could be just like pickles on a burger when they don't eat pickles, or just no, I just never eat pickles. No fuck pickles, you know. It's just whatever the fuck it is. They just they have this like shut down like this is my line and I will not cross it. And that's kind of what he was doing when I just mentioned this alternative method of doing stuff. Um, and and the same goes with all these dipshits that keep constantly. You know, trying it's we're we're growing out of the fucking shit, but at the same time, uh, I've been grateful for all of the, the the having fun with just trying a different thing. I brought these things back because, frankly, what the it was thanks to my friend Doug Davis who did the very first in the meantime with me and Dave on YouTube. Um, he was my first guest. He's one of my oldest friends. He's a guy that looks like one of these assholes that would be like, you know, no, I don't ever do it. Doug isn't even a comedian. He's just a cool dude who says funny shit. And he had an open enough mind to come over and be my guest on a fucking thing that he had no idea what it would be and whatever. And and I'm grateful he was the first person on it. Um, 
And that's, you know, so I, so, when, and I would say when you're that close minded, it explains the music choices you made for bands to participate in because, you know, and again, and he's a good drummer. Don't get me wrong. Good drummer. He's in like one or two all right bands. But, um, main thing is he's a cool dude. And so when Mordred hit him up about doing some doing this thing, he just passed it off to me. Like Dave's a whore. He'll do whatever the fuck you, you know, you throw it at him. If there's a, you know, dangle a few dollars, maybe he might do something. Um, and I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, I really didn't know what to expect, and I know that these are, like, guys that they reunited, like, I don't know, like, five years ago or something, and, um, you know, they're a polished band, they've done some shit, uh, you know, they're, they've, uh, but they're working dudes, they're not, you know, they're just regular guys, have jobs and all that shit, oddly enough, where I live right now, two of the members worked on a house directly across the street in the last uh, four years I've been living here, it was, like, a couple years ago, they were working there, so little did I know. Members of Mordred were working, you know, and it's and it's just a strange thing because I had one of their cassettes when I was younger and all that shit. That now here I am, forty three, and yeah, I'm working with these guys that um doing this thing. They wanted me to write sketches. I don't write sketches. I'm not. I, I really just you know, I had that time where I was that creative. I wrote screenplays and all that kind of stuff. I even made some short films. You saw one, Dave versus the Chairs, um, and. Quite frankly, I wasn't that interested. But Sean's, you know, my projection of Sean's mental image of me is correct. I am a whore. Um, I, I mean, when I have this time, I have nothing to do. What, I mean, I do have things to do now, but at the t it's like, what the fuck else am I going to do? Sure, I'll try to make this work. So, I, because I have a fucking open mind, I keep an open mind. Who knows what the opportunity will present itself? So, you know, so I, uh, I ended up. I ended up uh, agreeing, met, you know, talked to the guys, um, wrote a sketch, and at first I it was I was kind of like, yeah, we'll see if this works, um, and we figured it out, and we actually shot it, and and I have to say I I it made me laugh. I don't laugh at shit. It made me laugh. So I'm looking forward to the sketch. I'll get a copy of it too once uh, the thing screens or whatever, and uh, be able to show it to you hopefully here. But I, what I can show you here is I also made a PSA commercial. For the thing, and I'm gonna debut it here first. So don't tell them. I mean, all 20 to 40 views that'll be here by Saturday. Don't tell them. But uh, this is the PSA I made for uh, for the show. And now a public service announcement. Fire. Riots. Civil unrest. Climate change. Natural disasters. Girl sucking my dick and giving me coke from Cancel me. culture. I think I'm fucking kidding you. Fuck yeah, you gotta suck my dick to get up in the belly room. I'm making call for you. Disease. Nuclear threats. Okay, good job. Good job, slow. Hollaback fails. Oh, oh. All the girls don't be like this. Racism. Police brutality. How many girls did you have do that? Oh, 20. Sexual predators. <laughs> I had this little blonde open mic chick dog that used to come up to the comedy store with a 20 and just take me up to the belly room and suck my dick and go do her set. She was tremendous. Kung flu. I can name. Incompetent leadership. 19 different versions of names. What can I do? Go back to sleep. This has been a public service announcement from Mean Dave, one lazy MF. So hopefully you like it, huh? You might know if you're a fan, if you follow the Mean Time a little bit, you'll see the, uh, you'll see a couple, uh, you'll see at least one, one Mean Time. Uh, mascot the hollaback baby so anyways uh so yeah before i keep going any further let's uh now do our long version checking in segment this is uh the the podcast portion of in the meantime uh with jonathan ott hey dave checking in you know what's been doing well these days since i uh the shelter in place, my house plants. 
Yeah, all this quality time I've been at home with them. They have just been taking off. So, hope you're doing well. Fucking Griffin Daly's asking if I'm on TikTok yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, fuck it. It's like, dude, you're the oldest motherfucker I know is trying to tell it, ask me if I'm on TikTok. Welcome to, in the meantime, uh, our checking in segment here. Uh, our, you know, one of our, our you know, our, or the mega check-in. I don't know what, what the fuck I call it on the thing, but uh, here with me is one of my dearest friends, favorite people in comedy and life, Jonathan Ott, everybody. Wonderful for you to, to join join me here in our, our little... I'm going to be folding some laundry, too, uh, while we're yeah. chatting here. So uh, how you doing, man? Doing good, man. Not as good as you. You just took that big-ass dump. <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, man. I, I take big dumps. Actually, it wasn't even a whole lot. It just takes a while to come out sometimes. So, you know, it's an age thing. I eat zucchini to try and uh, try and get that shit, you know, smoother. Because it's shit, cause it's shit shaped? It's, well, no, <laughs> I don't know. Are you aware that zucchini is like one of the, it's, uh, I don't even know what they call that shit. It's, uh, what do they call, uh, what, what, what is, what are the things they call that help you shit? I, I forget. Oh, fiber? Fibrous? No, nah, I don't know if it's so much fibrous. There's, uh, you know, what's, what's the stuff that you take if you, that they give you the X-lax? Oh, laxative, laxative. Laxative, thank you. It's a natural laxative. Oh, is it? Uh, I mean, I, I dare anybody to eat a lot of zucchini and squash and not have to take a shit within a half hour uh, huh. afterwards. You Maybe always I'm surprise dying. me. You always surprise me with how fucking, like, how much shit you know, like the breadth of knowledge that you have. It's random. It's not like I really have I know, to. but it's still, it's like, oh, I didn't know that. It's from trial and error. It's not, <laughs> it's really. <laughs> okay, so let's start watering. Just get a cup of water. No, I don't drink out of this cup. And you just water. Okay, there's one plant. Whoops. There's another plant. Oh, nice and thirsty plants. And there's a plant right there that's fake. Actually, I made that plant out of concrete. Uh, this is my basil, and it sits in water. This one here was outside, and I brought it inside. Nina G and I went on, uh, we, we did a show in um, Portland uh, for the, for a college, um, up at Lynn Benton college. And, uh, cause she gets, she gets these really cool college shows that we do from time to time. Um, uh, where we, it's comedians with disabilities show. It's really kind of her one woman show and I'm her feature. And, and I'm one of the, I'm the redheaded stepchild of the, the disability world because, uh, people in recovery, uh, for alcoholism or addiction, are covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act. This is something she found from talking. I, I, I hosted one of her one of her trial one woman shows, and I described uh, the addict brain in comparison to what she's told me about the dyslexic brain. And she to this is again full credit to Nina G and and just you know how brilliant she is with right. with uh, with all of these subjects. She. And I, it, a light bulb went off. She looked up the ADA and, and found that, in fact, people in recovery are covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act as it is, so long as you're in recovery, it's considered a mental illness. That makes and, sense. Like, I'm really grateful about that because, you know, like some of my family is fucking addicts. A lot of my family are addicts. And I was just, about it. yeah. on Father's Day, I was hanging out with, my dad, but also my uncle who it's weird. They're both like 14 year olds mentally. And he was like, he's 47 mm -hmm. and he sits down next to me and he's like, Hey man, you want to burn? I'm like, uncle Tom, no, I'm 35. You're 47. I don't want to burn. You know, he lives with my grandmother, his mom. And then he's like, Hey bro, I got to show you something. And I'm like, is it going to be your fucking weed collection again? I hope not. <laughs> and he's like, no, he goes, no, it's not come here. And I'm like, so I go to his room and he's like, actually it is. <laughs> <laughs> he opens up his closet. 
like a 14 year old right and you know because you have experience with like uh that was me it's like that could have been me he shows me and he's got he's like yeah that's fucking birthday cake man and that's fucking and i'm just like dude you're 47 but i didn't say that because you know i don't want to hurt his feelings yeah no that's exactly that's what anybody sensible would think right but so that that makes sense like I, i think that's awesome they it is a disability it's well it's it here's the thing about it was like she the it's funny because everything you described there was everything that was i have an uncle too it's my my stepdad's brother who has like struggled so much with uh he's been an active addiction and i remember him when i was a kid he was you know really cool dude and and he used to play bass he wasn't the best bass player by any means but we would jam and um and, uh, you know, and as I got older, I, I kind of was seeing some of the things that were like kind of always quite like I, I was starting to see the man child. This guy was a tall dude. So, you know, naturally when they're tall, you assume that they're adults. Right. And, uh, and then when he when uh, I just remember as I got older and I started to see little by little that like, you know, oh, you know, he smoked weed and how like, I don't know how cool that is as I'm in my 20s. Right. And it's seeing- weird you outpace them. It's it's the weirdest thing. It's, it was just one of those things that I remember thinking, like, do I want to be like that when I'm older? And, uh, and, and it, was a, it was a fear, that I, a genuine fear that I had that I was going to be one of those, I was going to be that uncle to my nephew or, or whatever. And um, I remember even thinking after my nephew was born that when he's, you know, older, I don't, I, I don't, because I was, he was born in 2005. I had moved back into my parents' house in 2010, so he was five. And my goal was to get out of that their house, uh, well, obviously as quick as possible. But that kept, you know, being put off mainly because of my disease and my uh, my foray into stand-up comedy in 2010, and um, and just struggling with all kinds of problems. And um, and then as I felt myself kind of sinking deeper and deeper into my addiction, while still technically being there, even though I wasn't there a lot because I was staying at people's places and, you know, just, I was just, uh, my stuff was there. Half my stuff was there. Half of it was also in my buddy's storage spot. And, um, and so, uh, uh, I just remember thinking that like my goal, my new goal was to get out of there before I, after I got really, after I got in recovery and realized I was going to need to stay there. I was needing to stay there now to, to kind of get in. Luckily they, they, you know, it, it's just it's a fucking blessing looking back yeah. on it but um but my new goal was like i need to be out of this house before i hit 40 <laughs> uh because <laughs> Damn, I, lofty I, goals <laughs> I, I got out of there i got out of there at 39 <laughs> 2016 uh in in i moved in here in may of 2000 at the may of 2000 well i think like june of 2016 and uh and yeah and i was 39 turning 40 that september <laughs> and uh and and, the thing, and so my nephew, at that time, he's eleven, and uh, and he he's not really that preoccupied with me at all. I mean, he he's cool with me. He thinks I'm, you know, he knows I I'm a smart ass and I make jokes that you know he he gets. Um, yeah. But he's not even like he's seen my comedy, not impressed at all, which I love. <laughs> um, That's awesome. Yeah, he's funny too. He made uh, he's made some videos, uh, like because my my sister always my, the funniest thing is my sister used to be. Uh, used to go nuts uh, when I was growing up. Uh, like things about me would just drive her nuts I, I, here and there. And it, it was so random. Um, like siblings though. In a way, but like I wasn't that preoccupied with what, I mean, I was the older sibling, I guess. Um, and I think a lot of it had to do with, you know, she, she you know, uh, just being her, she would have like certain expectations of what she thought an older brother was. Uh-huh. And in some ways I was those when, you, when she didn't expect it. And, but in a lot of times I wasn't. And, um, and, but she also, you know, she's, she's her own, she, I mean, she, she finally diagnosed herself as bipolar or whatever. Everybody's bipolar, I think in some way. Yeah. Um, but she, uh, she ended up, uh, when she had her kid, one of the things she said, uh, she goes, I, I can't believe that I had, it. my son is my brother. And, uh, which made me laugh just because <laughs> I just know how much I drive her. I would unintentionally uh. drive her nuts. <laughs> And now here's this kid that she, you know, is obligated to love and raise. <laughs> and it reminds her so much of me at times. And at first, I, he, he is like me, except without the 
the I would say like without the the ominous uh, kind of uh, doom. Yeah, without the doom factor, and because I I see it, but he he has. He's such a sweet kid, and he's managed to make it. He's 15 now, and he's managed to make it through half of his teenage years um, still retaining levels of that innocence without, like, I, it, it is me without this bitter baggage, and I, and I see it in him. And, and I always wonder, it's like, what was the difference between me and them? And I think primarily was because her, and, her and his father, they didn't stay together, and they had – they didn't, but they kind of, with all the tensions they had between them, they worked together to really raise the kid in as much of a, a supportive, you know, cooperation, a cooperative uh, relationship in, in raising him. I think that has a lot to do with it. You froze up, I think. <laughs> Either that or you're falling asleep. <laughs> God damn it. Oh, by the way, uh, if you have fake plants, remember which fit plants are fake so you don't end up watering fake plants. All right, we're back. I think my internet went down for a second there. Sorry about that there, folks. Not like anybody in the fucking meantime editing universe is going to know. But, um, yeah, no, so I was talking about my nephew. So, yeah, he's he's cool. But he, if the I was trying to think what the doom factor, where that came from. And, yeah, my sister and my my his dad they got along better because actually i was uh i made that long post you probably saw it about my dad yeah um, yeah and um because i was thinking about the irony of uh calling my dad and leaving him messages as well as text messages on father's day knowing full well that on father's day um really that's like we you know we joke about it that's the day that he kind of like wants for himself to just be left alone from the kids and I and and all he requires really is just to, to be acknowledged, and um, and that's a long way from the guy that I remember growing up. There were times I did not feel like I loved my dad growing up. Was and, he kind of like a drama queen, or like was he kind of like a drama queen, or what? What uh, was you, it? You would think it was. You know, it's funny because as far as drama queen, I wouldn't call him a drama queen. It was. Uh, yeah when I look back on, on just kind of like, you know, being my, my, I can't imagine having a family in my twenties, you know, and that's the, there's a generation, like a total difference of how people had kids, like the way I saw it growing up. My mom and my dad got married in their twenties, had kids in their twenties too. And, um, and they were, they were somewhat high school sweethearts that then my mom, as she got, you know, kind of older, he, my dad got into some alcohol um, he's an alcoholic and, um, uh, but he was also a successful insurance, uh, sales. Uh, he wasn't, I don't know if he was a sales, he wasn't really a salesman. He was, but he could say a broker. So he was like, insurance yeah, something, something like that. And he was pretty successful at, it, but then he got really, he got caught up in some kind of just some, some stuff that, uh, my mom would tell me about, but he hasn't been, you know, I, I don't like prying to him, prying him about, you know, some of the, his darker days, but, um, just he had like a lot of problems with the taxes and all that for years, but um, and yeah, and he hit bottom, and he hit bot when he hit bottom was right at the time that my mom left him, uh, got with the man who was eventually be my stepdad. Um, there was a lot of turmoil. It was ugly, and it, and, it, and he was not making it easy on anybody. He that was, that what you mentioned though about people having kids in their twenties. That's mm -hmm. I was raised by my aunt and uncle. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of their story too. You know, my aunt took us in, mm -hmm. um, and they were both at their twenties and it was hard. Cause I mean, when you're 20, I don't think you're fully matured, you know, still a kid, right? Kid yeah. Kid, essentially. And I mean, and that's, that was like just kind of the norm back then. And, yeah. and, and it's somewhat the norm. I mean, there's people that do it today too, but it's, but I, uh, I think that there was like this time period of, um, like it was the norm. And then in that transition period, which I think was our parents, it's like people, some people were still staying younger, you know what I mean? Not having kids waiting later. And then these, the people that were, you know, they kind of, their friends were all out still having fun and stuff in their twenties. And then they weren't there. I mean, they were the boomers. That's as far as right. I know, they were the boomer generation. It was just what they thought. It was what they thought they were supposed to do. You know, it was like, this is what society dictates. And this is what, you know, we do. And, um, 
And me personally, I mean, I just remember, I didn't, you know, I didn't put a lot of thought into it. All I remember was that it was very uncomfortable. Okay. He's uh, not a kid person. Never was. He was into his job and he liked the, he, he wanted his fa- his family was more, it's funny when I, his favorite, he loves uh, mafia lore. He loves mob movies. And stuff. <laughs> he, he loves the Godfather movie and Godfather and Godfather part two are, you know, some of the best three. It has the, the word back. father in it. Huh? <laughs> it has the word father in it. <laughs> yeah. But what, but the thing about it is when I go, when I went back, I remember it was sometime in my twenties or thirties when I started getting into those movies and, um, and I watched Godfather part two and it's chilling the, the relationship that he has with Kay, uh, when their mar- when their fall- marriage is falling apart and they have two kids, they have an older son and a, and a daughter right. and watching the fallout of, of how that happened very much mirrored <laughs> what I saw in how my mom and my, my, uh, my, my dad broke apart. It was ugly. And so your dad was a Godfather. Not a guy. He he wished he was. He was he was the not father really. And, but at, that was at that time. And he he. Uh, I mean, again, it's like. And I, you know, the thing about it was like, he he then would take an interest in the kids primarily because of custody, because be, to to spite my mom and stuff like that. And when he would take us, he was again. He was still kind of broken, figuring out his, you know, how to get out of the hole he was in. So we'd spend a lot of time at my grandma's. He would take us and he would leave us at our grandma's while he's off doing shit. So that's when it's like, it, it's not, he, and his way of placating us was trying to buy, buy us stuff. Right. And, and, and it wasn't, you know, it's, it, but it was, it was just a, there were windows of time where my dad was cool, but it wasn't that often and it wasn't consistent. And, um, and then, uh, and, and again, it was, this was all very tumultuous during my formative years. I learned these things later when I read about addiction. Uh, this guy, Dr. Gabor Mate, wrote a great book called In the Realm of the Hungry Ghost. And he's done a lot of great research on addiction. And he has boiled down addiction of all kinds, not just drugs, but like compulsion, all of this, to, um, to trauma and stress during the formative years. Hmm. And that trauma could be anything from the womb to, you know, high amounts of stress, uh, you know, in, you know, from ages zero to seven. And that was when my life was the most tumultuous and stressful. And as far as everything else, once they divorced and my mom and my stepdad, my, my, at the time was, he was just her boyfriend, but they were together for years and didn't get married until I was 13. But they, she would always ask if we had a problem with that. We're like, no, he's just, he's our rock. Who cares? Like as long as they're together, we're good. Like me and my sister did not care. Um, cause he was the, he was the stability. My mom changed after my dad took us on an unannounced, uh, trip to Arizona to scare her and, uh, maybe dabble in like, you know, it was, it was, it was kind of like, it was one of these things where it's like, you know, he probably was drunk and thought, you know, it's, it's like, it was, it was, it's not like he really was kidnapping us because my mom right. didn't figure out where we were, but he, she, he just made her have to find out through my grandmother. I got, I got kidnapped by my grandmother when I was like eight. Yeah. She drunkenly, she just took me from my aunt at the time and just drove me and we were, she was drunk and then there was a police chase (laughs) and she was dumb and she tried to drive up this mountain Uh (laughs) to get away from the police. So just at the top of the mountain, they pulled us over. (laughs) See, And here's the thing, like whatever, like during your like being from like you know being a baby till you were like seven or eight like because you're not you're not an alcoholic you're not a drug addict yeah. you somehow avoided all that do you do you have any level of like memory of of stability or chaos from those times oh it was all chaos it was all chaos and yet it somehow, was all chaos yeah so so in in that case you're not you don't fit the the bill of someone who uh, would would then have issues of you know this this compulsion it's strange how it works okay you know what i've thought a lot about this actually and like uh everyone i know who who has this because you know my brother was an addict uh, an addict (laughs) fucking addict addict. yeah um he was always like he was very emotionally involved in it okay in all the chaos and shit i would literally like go off into the woods by myself to get away Oh. And so I think I kind of separated myself emotionally, so I wasn't as damaged. My brother was always like fighting, you know, with my stepdad and all this. Acting out, yeah, yeah. So it, it's funny because I was quiet too myself. And the thing I look back on is like, if it wasn't drugs, it would have been something else. 
Like I would have, cause there was compulsive behavior going on even before I, I got into drugs and alcohol. Um, that stuff really came later. And you think it would have been vagina? Do you think you would have been a pussy fiend? No, not, not, well, I mean, to, to, in, in any more than anybody else. I mean, really a lot of, <laughs> I mean, if anything, what really kind of steered clear of that was just the fact that I, I, you know, was, I was very shy, painfully shy, uh, was very, just, I did not handle all that stuff well. And I didn't like about how long, about how long were you shy? You know what I mean? Like cripplingly shy. So I was until what age? Shy when I lost my virginity, twenty-two, man. So and still, that was it, it's only because it, it's just it was so uh, you know you're you're dictated to by what it's supposed to be like in the movies. That is that's bullshit. Right. Got into some attempts at relationships with people that weren't very kind and or just you know kind of manipulative in their own. Just a lot of stuff. I don't put it on them. Um, I did not know how to talk to people and be. It, like I, it's, it's just so strange. Uh, it was, it was really, I was operating from this place of like a chronic people pleaser, but yet also manipulative. It's all these behaviors that all tie into addiction eventually in some way, shape or form. And, um, I guess some people, you, you, I don't know, maybe you're just built of steel there, John. I, I, no, I, I, not you know, at all. Well, I mean, you, I definitely, you, I think it built up and that's why I have a brain tumor. That's my theory. Maybe. Just Maybe held it all inside. Right in there. That's interesting, though, like the people pleasing, because obviously, like, we both do comedy, and I think there's a little bit of that in it. Totally. For totally. us. That's, that's the. But, like, my brother who, who turned to addiction, he, like, I had this conversation with him once because when I was, I don't know how it was for you in, like, high school, junior high, but, um, you know, I got, like, C's, like, all the way through school. My brother got straight A's. My brother's very smart. Mm. But it was, like, it was for people. Yeah, that's how I was too. That was exact, I was straight A okay. student to some B's here and there. Senior year, I fucked off because I and I found I got into acid. Senior year, <laughs> and, and, uh, yeah. I mean, I wasn't I mean, even I like into. Like, I was even. I didn't, I didn't like weed all that much. Never really had an attraction to hard drugs. Didn't even like alcohol. alcohol. It was it was <laughs> acid, acid that really. That really, really it, and it was and it was because, because I had this, I had this psychological, psychological experience, experience of. of Hearing my manipulative brain out loud and learning how much I didn't trust people when I was doing shit. And I was honest with myself about that. Um, you know, they always say, don't look in the mirror when you're on psychedelics. So of course, I want to look in the mirror. And, and, uh, and I'm like, oh, this ain't so bad. I just realized why. Because everybody's, because you, you see every all of your insecurities, all of your faults, all of your... All of your all honesty. Of your, and, and so I was, I was really in my head. Well, that's when I learned, I felt like I learned that honesty is always the best policy. And, and so I, so I, I, I <laughs> you hear that, kids? Like, kids. It, it became it, it became <laughs> bad, man. Because, because then, then I, I like I my like friend Mario, Mario, who I used to get, get high with and stuff growing up. Growing up. Uh, uh, he, I love how he put it. He goes, "You were always quiet ever since." Because he met me when I was like like sixteen, and he was like, "Dude, I met you, and you were quiet all through." You know, and then you did all that acid between like you know seven, like sixteen and twenty three. Then you turned twenty three, and you wouldn't shut the fuck up. You got ideas. <laughs> it, it, it's, 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 but it's, it's kind of true. Like I, 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 there was I, something, there was about, something about developing a sense of confidence, confidence in, in, in all of, all of, all of this, this, this bullshit, bullshit I amounted to myself. It, it was candled in music and my imagination, imagination all that and stuff. stuff. And, um, um, and I think there's, I think there's something, something it, George, George Carlin put it best. It's like, like drugs, drugs, there's, there's, there's a point where drugs do open your mind, but then if you, if you think it's the drugs, then, and you keep doing them, then it becomes an unhibited. And, yeah, um, uh, and he's, he's absolutely, he's absolutely right. right. And, yeah, you know, yeah, cause, cause I, if I, if I, if I just would have learned that the Melvins, the Melvins were not were drugs, not drugs uh, I, probably I probably would have taken, taken that, that and, 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 and th because, because I, I, I thought, I thought those, guys those guys were so, were so incredible, incredible as a band, band and, 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 and being unique, unique and individual, individual truly, truly, uh, a sound that was, it was just strange to be, to, to see that, to, to kind of hear something that I totally related to. And, and you know, from you these know, guys, guys that were you know from from, from, from the, the northwest, northwest, northwest who weren't who weren't, weren't, weren't obsessed, obsessed with trying, trying to achieve, achieve the, the, the cliche, cliche rock, rock and roll lifestyle. lifestyle. They just they wanted just to rock, rock and rock, rock well. well. But it wasn't it to wasn't get to get chicks. It wasn't to do drugs. It wasn't. It was to just make a living, or to find their way and do it and to express themselves in this honest, unique sound with conviction. And they did. And, um, and uh, if I would have learned, learned that, that because, because it was, it was drugs, drugs that made me really get into, really into their, into their, into their, their music, music more, more um, um, 
you know, but I got into them before I even right, right, right. did drugs. Did drugs. Yeah. It was just when yeah. I heard them on drugs, I'm like, oh, 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 I get it. Then it's like, no, no. Because these guys weren't on, like, they tried them, but they weren't, they did this shit sober. Uh, you know, and that's so, and that's that's even more of an impression. It makes sense when you look back on how how difficult their music is to like play. Um, it made perfect sense, and um, and I just wish I would have learned that then because you know, right. it took me all this time to, but then again, I, I look at how everything's worked out, and, and I'm like, eh, I, I am where as recovery's taught me, I am where I'm supposed to be, right? And, uh, and yeah, and like Happy Gilmore finding out he's a fucking golfer. When, uh, when he thought he was a hockey player. So I'm like, well, I guess I've been a comedian. Because I did love getting, I love getting laughs. I just never thought to, I'm like, I'm like I don't want to be a comedian. I like funny people. I love funny people, actually, because those are my best, my best friends from growing up. And my best friends today are the people who make me laugh and not the ones that necessarily are the, the, the ones that do it best on stage as much as right. they do it best at, like, that's those are the people I love being around. The people that like when you know you know that, and you're hilarious. You're oh, probably one of the funniest people I know from all of this <laughs> shit. And what's awesome is to see you know yeah maybe it took a tumor and whatever else to reach the point of fuck it, but you know, when I when I see you now that'll do it. In ninety nine percent of cases, I think the tumor, the old brain tumor, will give you the fuck it feeling. Dude, I'm you, man, I wish I, I got to see more of your set on Saturday. We got to do the, our comedy drive-in. John kicked it off after oh, that's nice. that. That and you know, and I warmed him up with one of my old bits. But I, I heard I heard honking and I saw lights flashing when from when I left, and I could hear it from when I was going to pick up my my chili dog that they kept fucking up the order on. And uh, and I got back in time to catch the end. And uh, but yeah, you're you're lighting it up, and I've, and that's and every time I've seen you. Even in even in the situation of like Vinny's when a set wasn't going exactly well, you weren't you weren't like like I remember when you when before all of this stuff when you were doing comedy kind of your first run through, you know you would do your material but you got a little like kind of sheepish a little when when you yeah. would do it if it wasn't going well and I'm like this dude's fucking hilarious like for I don't sure know. well you're right and it's totally the like not giving a fuck because before like I cared like I cared yeah. a lot yeah. and when, when people I took that as like a personal loss. When people weren't laughing, you know, I'd be like, I'd get sad. It's yeah. weird. And that's the opposite, right, of what you want in a comedy show. Like, when the comic gets sad. Oh, you, yeah, it's got to be <laughs> The people out. don't want to see that shit. It's got to be balls out confidence. And that's, I can tell when my, my like, and that's where I've kind of reached the point of where it's like, I'm more or less relaxed. I care too much almost now. I've, I've got to remember to say uh, from time to time. You do great. You do great, too, with, uh, like, when crowds get shitty, where other comics, especially, like, the the... There's a difference, too, I think, between, um, like, when comics put it on that they're having a great time and, you know, and you can tell that they're not. The audience knows. And I've seen you at the Punchline before. I remember one night specifically where the, I forget who was hosting at the time, but, you know, they were like, <laughs> you know, and the audience was just like, what the fuck? And then when you got on stage, you were like, hey, guys, how's it going? Don't worry. I feel just like you. And they all started <laughs> busting up because you related. Yeah, oh, that was awesome. It's, I mean, that's yeah, it's it's bad because that's what I feel. I always feel like comedy a lot at this level. You get a lot of the bad salesmen, right. you know, the bad car salesmen, the bad politicians. Yeah. I'll probably be a minor league ball player at this bullshit for whatever, and that's fine with me. This wasn't. Right. This was. I was. I was just talking. I was hanging out with Mike Bucci, the guy who produced the driving show just now, and uh, and we were talking about it because one of the things that. Um, I was I was in uh, uh, Nina G's discussion of the, of her uh, comedy capsule thing. She ought to talk to you. I had to tell her to talk to you actually in those interviews, because um, one of the things that I I just in talking with her and her asking questions, uh, I gave an answer about what it is like. Kind of my comp my goals have changed differently after I got in recovery and stuff, and because uh, I always felt that like just pursuing this to try and achieve, you know, it's like. It was it was a personal goal, yes, once I saw that I possibly could get past at the punchline and all that stuff. That's great because I when I started, I never saw him. I always thought I was going to be such an outsider. I was never going to achieve that. So I, I did that, and I even got into a club at Rooster Teeth Feathers where I know the lady doesn't like me, but it was because <laughs> I, I proved undeniable. I remember talking to you about that like yeah, before. She, she still didn't like me, and she still was putting on, put, trying to make me jump through hoops, and I realized I, I didn't get into this to have a boss. I didn't get into it, and I've been I've been able to make a living 
uh, doing comedy for the most part on my terms where yes, it's great to be part of the, the part of the, some of the approval of the best shit in the area, but that is definitely not, I don't want to, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be the guy who tries to become the CEO of a company from the ground floor up because nobody, nobody makes that really. I mean, that doesn't happen. Right. It's really strange. I was talking with Booch about this and, and, and then I, and in, with realizing that my goal is different in that it, comedy and, and a lot of entertainment avenues with the Melbourne stop me, the future of it has totally been DIY because the industry has yeah. burned themselves out. Whoever is famous today, today, is either were people that were famous already from prior to when social media and all this influx of technology has existed. So it's only enhanced it or made you deeper into the up their ass through like right. you know, social media and whatnot. But the people who have gained notoriety since then have not done it. They, they've, they've been like these, it's way like WWE shepherds, their talent. Like these are people, they, they're, they're a bunch of uh, Johnny Bravos, like, you know, from, from uh, Brady Bunch. They fit the suit. They get somebody who then they, they right. invest their time and energy in to breed into this, into, into their own entity that they own. And then now you're kind of like this, uh, as people would call it, a corporate cuck. Um, and that's what people, that's what all of these new people really are, are aiming for. And I'm like, I don't want that. I want to, I right. want to develop something that's solid, that's individual on my own. And that, and that what I really get out of this, and this is where recovery, like being of service and, and these, these principles that that shit's taught me is that I like applying that to the comedy world where I've, I've enjoyed shepherding newer comics or comics that are growing and whatnot, having these rooms that are the rooms that, that help me, not just these specific rooms that I've had, but also, you know, cause I, I cut my teeth in the place, like trying to get good in all the places that everybody sucked at, you know, it's like, <laughs> I want to be good in the, in the worst room. And, and, and if I can right. develop that level of consistency, then if I hit a stage with a good audience, I imagine I'll do great, which that math worked. But, um, but then once you kind of get to a point of where, yeah, you start becoming established and, uh, and you get a reputation, all that, it's hard to then break free from that. So I can see a lot of the trouble that people find themselves in when they're, they're compromised by, by having corporate masters or, uh, or they're beholden even in here, the, there's no corporate master. What the master is, is the collective conscience of conformity, which, uh, which then you get into the, the woke politics, you get into uh, this, this comedian brotherhood and sisterhood and all, all of this horse shit. Right. And I'm like, you know what I realized? Fuck all these people. I just want to build everything that I'm doing with the people I love working with. And what I look at it as is being similar to the end of the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, um, which is one of my favorite movies. It, I, it's one of these movies that I've, has helped me gain insight into having a life of a lot of like, I would say disappointment with like, you know, goals and whatever. And George Bailey's in that movie you know, through his whole, through the whole movie, he has all these dreams of like, I'm going to leave Bedford Falls and I'm going to go be a success in architecture. I'm going to go do that. I'm going to go to Europe. I'm going to go all these fucking places. And every fucking time he's about ready to go off and do something cool, uh, something fucks up at home and he has to stay home to do, mm -hmm. to be of service to his family or his community or just something. And then in the process, the woman who's in love with them, uh, he then figures that out and they get married and have, with an awkward love scene uh, that, uh, that scene will always be awkward, but, um, uh, but then, and then has a family and then ends up, you know, going on with the Bailey and loan, Bailey, the savings and loan. And, and, um, and then throughout his life, the, the fact was, is through all of that, he ends up uh, spending a lifetime being of service to the community and and then reaching this point where yeah now you got this you know Mr. Potter is trying to fuck him over and all that whatever all the story arc bullshit um, but he reaches a point of where he thinks that this is all for nothing that now I'm just I'm, now I'm this fucking loser that everybody that's just gonna get screwed over and uh, and you know he doesn't realize he's he's being manipulated and and whatever but um, and then he tries to kill himself and he fucks that up too because some angel you know this is where the bullshit comes in. But, um, but all the whole thing was, was to then bring him back to this point of teaching him how to be grateful for what he has and realizing that, that everything that he has is everything that, that a person could want and, and work for whatever. And all these people come to his rescue 
when they learn that he's in trouble because he's, he's helped all these people through his entire life. And that, and that said, you know, there's, you know, there, uh, a person isn't rich who has, or a person is always rich who has friends. And, and that's where I was like, that's, that is really the true investment of, of just sort of like living a life. It's, it's having a life worth living that you want to live. And, and, and I'm like, yeah, that's what recovery's taught me is, is just really like to, to, to build those things and, and invest in the people that you, that you love and believe in versus like, you know, and, and yeah, and all of a sudden, and I can see people trying to attempt that in the popular comedy world, but I don't buy it. I, because it's, well, it's, so, it's always second. That's the second motive. Oh, it totally is. It's, it's always the second motive. Yeah. The first, I mean, that's where, you know, and then they get the, again, like that's why they always keep calling each other out and they're always stabbing each other in the back over the skeletons in the closet that they all have. We all right. got them. You know, none of them, none of us are perfect, but at the same time, it's like, they all, it's like, you know, people are like figuring out, oh yeah, the comedy store has been a comedy fraternity for years, you know? And, and yeah, it, it's, it's primarily a boys club. There's some women that have gotten in there too. And, but at the same time, yeah, it's not the healthiest environment for, mm. for the, for progression. Uh, and any popular entertainment industry, right? Yeah, I mean, and, and the fact is, too, it's like, and just because something is, you know, the, it's it's just one of those things where, yeah, we used to be able to laugh at the the, the fuck-ups and the, and the, and the, the scumbags. Like, scumbags, right. yeah. You know, we laugh at some of it because, yeah, it's fucked up. Uh, but then now to, like, to then put it through this filter of judgment through social media of, like, every single thing under scrutiny, and I'm like... I get, I get where that, because I, and I witnessed it myself where with, when I called out somebody locally one time, I didn't call them out so much as I shared an article, uh, that some, or a, a blog that someone posted about this one guy who really was just, he, he's been always a benign jackass. He ended up getting scared off of the community from it. But, um, and then somebody who was trying, who was, who there's these two people who are like always kind of antagonistic and contrarian and whatever, all these buzzwords, but they were friends of mine. And I, and I, I, you know, I, I wish that we stayed friends, but they were always just difficult to deal with. But, um, but one of them pointed out that like was trying to point out when she brought up this story of when I was, yeah, I was drunk and I, I was kind of complimenting her and, and I ended up like, you know, with her seemingly permission, feeling her leg and whatnot, but I had just met her. And, um, and it was, she said, like when I, when I talked to her, I said, how, how did that make you feel? Like, cause I, she brought it up on the thread and then immediately I was like, you know, Hey, whatever I did, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for. And then I even talked to her in a chat and she said, no, I, I actually, I liked it, but I'm trying to point out to you that there's, you know, the more that we kind of like start putting these in these public forum type things and, and going after people, it's, it's not healthy. And she's right. Even though she was kind of insane too, but she's, she's <laughs> right. Um, and but it's like, how do you go about addressing that shit? Right. You know, because, because we don't have authorities that are addressing the shit. People, scumbags do keep getting work. Um, but it's really, I, and here's what I, I was telling Bucci. It's like, what has to happen, really, is that, and this is, this is where I think is, is the ultimate justice of comedy. Woke comedy has to, be, has to get better than the scumbag comedy. That's yep. the bottom line. You want to win this fucking war of righteousness and, and, and truly have this spiritual awakening of, of, you know, of the industry itself. It has to start with, with making something attractive. That's undeniably, you know, and, and, you know, I would dare say it's not like, you know, Hannibal Thompson, like calling out Bill Cosby on that shit, you know, it was pretty, yeah, yeah. but that kind of got the ball rolling on people going after Cosby I don't know if, I mean, again, it's like there's, it's double-edged sword. Cause I also, I can't, I've watched Hannibal Thompson. I can't, or not Hannibal Thompson. I know Hannibal, Hannibal Burress. Burress, um, Burress. Hannibal Burress, uh, Hannibal Thompson's actually a really cool guy. But um, Burress, uh, I, I've watched him and he's, he represents a lot of this, the, the, the young, cause he, every one of his stories starts with, is one of his, his comedy routines. I was doing comedy in, uh, in Chicago and then and I'm like, oh, these are just road stories. Right. And, and I, I think like uh, to your point, I, I think that what I see and we were talking about this the other day at the drive in, it's like nobody it's not constructive. All mm -hmm. the calling people out and shit, it just it's taking somebody down, but it's not building anything up. No. You know what I mean? In its yeah. place. There's nothing in its place. Mm -hmm. And so like you said, like unfortunately people smut is entertaining. 
Yeah. And so I mean, people want really, this drama and, and shit. And you know who benefits from all this shit is all just the social media. It's just, yeah. it's, it's the Twitter. Twitter doesn't give a shit what the conflict's about. They want all of this shit right. because they just, they benefit from it. Basically, Three tweets. All of the conflict, they basically made anger and, and arguments addictive because that's what, that's what people love. I remember fucking around with it when I was first on social media. And I knew that that was the reason I wasn't join. I didn't want to join Facebook when I started being a comedian. I warned, I remember Bryant Hicks kept telling me, he's like, you got to get on Facebook, Dave. And I was like, I didn't want to because I knew what I was going to do. I was just going to fuck around <laughs> with it. I was going to just me drive too. everybody nuts because I, I knew that I, because I came from the video game testing world and we talked mad shit to each other all the time. Right. I knew I was going to do, I did it on MySpace. And, and I'm like, and that's why I was like, nah, I'm not. But then when I realized that, well, it's generally the, the if you, once you start getting booked, people are looking for you on Facebook, Prime, oh, that over right. Twitter. And, uh, and I, I always hated Twitter because Twitter was just, I'm like, that's just my space without the, the music and the wallpapers. It's, uh, it's kind of the same shit. And, uh, I don't like it. Even though I check Facebook like often, I just don't like the constant, the feed. Oh, I don't yeah. like the, yeah. that word is horrible. Like, what yeah. are we? What, We're fucking what, consumers. What feeding, yeah. feed, here's your bag of feed. It's feeding you drama. It's feeding you, right. not just, and I don't know, it's, I mean, drama is what give, it's what, why, why we get, we like it. We get into right. it. We kind of feel like we need it. That's why you know these things are so addictive and the and all this kind well, of. Well, I think I think because our fucking lives are so boring and mundane. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That like we just want. It's like, oh, look at this shit's going on. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. So, and so yeah. So I like. I want to make a. I want to again just dominate with my boring comedy world. I like my boring friends. <laughs> uh, uh, Slow build. <laughs> no, I just. Feel, I feel like no. Nah, it's not even like they're. It's no, they're ne definitely not boring. It's just the fact that like Nina G's taught me make your own way. She's made her own way, and yeah, I mean, she yeah. does, cause, I mean, Think just the it. world that she has to deal with. I mean, you see, she posts a video yeah. on YouTube, takes advantage of of the, all the views that she's going to get from all those assholes, and, right. and will take right. the bank with those views. Yet at the same time, has to endure just the the just such the negative, disgustingly negative comments from strangers. Uh, I actually just got into it. Uh, with a stranger briefly, not long, but on a, uh, there's Oliver Graves, who's uh, our, one of our local comedian personalities, who's a oh, character. Yeah. I know him. Quite frankly, this dude, you would have thought that, that uh, you know, he had a Netflix special with the six minutes he's appeared <laughs> on America's Got Talent in 2018, a credit that <laughs> once, as soon as he got it, I'm like, because he was also good on it. Here's the trouble. He had nothing. Huh. He had, he had nothing further. He had, the guy has like 15 minutes at best tops. Uh, and and he's, he's a funny comic in this little niche. And it worked right. on that show. However, they didn't even brace it on America's Got Talent. And he had nothing to follow it up with. And, and it grew his, you know, his Instagram a little bit. It grew his Facebook fan page a little bit. But he didn't have like any online. He didn't have anything to follow it up. If I were, right. you know, Pee Wee Herman had like a whole fucking back, like backstory, had, had, a, had all of the, you know, these were people that had thought well thought out characters to, and, and things that they could contribute behind this thing. He's got basically an Edward Scissorhands rip off without the scissor hands. It's like Ed, Edward Scissormouth. Like he has no like a creative body of work, right? Yeah, and it's not to cut, cut him down as much as I've just watched him indulge in in embrace. And the fact is, is I've seen booty models butts get more followers than than the America's got. And he's had the spot. The thing too, he's had the, he got the most mileage out of his TV appearances than all of the TV appearances I've seen from the comics that have been somewhat successful that started when I started. And even ones before that late night spots and all that, he had more people watching him from that America's got talent spots than they did put together. And the, the, you know, from all of their glorified YouTube videos from appearing on late type late night spots, and yet the, the flip side of that is that was that alone was you'll get people taking interest in you. But if you have nothing for them to feed right. off of, um, there's people are going to be like, oh, that's it. And uh, and then not only that, people get sour after a while. Then they, they, they start turning on him after he now, he, you know, when it's, when things start, when a real opinions start popping up, I'm like, well, I, I liked you because you were funny. But now you're getting political and, and you just start <laughs> seeing this shit. So today all, it was hilarious. He, he made a very, uh, you know, because his character is very smug. And, uh, and he, made, he made some, uh, he was trashing uh, uh, Spider-Man Far From Home. 
uh, which is, it's like, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoy the Marvel movies, even the worst ones. And, uh, and I thought it was actually a nice follow-up after all the heavy handedness and infinity war and end game. So, and, but I jokingly bash him back of like, you know, like, like, uh, just having a fun insult back to him over the whole thing. And, um, and then he responds with a snarky response and, and we're being just sarcastic with each other. Right. And, uh, cause he was like saying, well, if you're whatever, he had a good response. And I was like, well, it was better than the 2018 season of America's Got Talent. And it was <laughs> definitely more realistic too. That's what I, I, I love giving him the dig at that. And, um, and then someone else chimed in and, and they were, they started trying to take, take jabs at me. And then I, and they were, they were saying like, you sound like some cunty 13 year old of da 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 And I'm like, uh, let, me, let me remind you who you're following. Which is the most cunty 13 year old thing to say. <laughs> well, well, not only that, but I'm like, uh, need I remind you that you're following a character that's based on a cunty, gothy 13 year old persona that, that, and, and you're sitting here splitting hairs. I'm like, first off, I'm, I'm joking with sarcastically with my buddy here, right. and, but you wouldn't know that you actually believe what you read on the internet. And that's the thing that, that I think we get suckered into. So I'm not even giving, this guy actually was laughing at some of my comments. So I think it took him a minute to understand that it's like, I'm doing this in jest. Like one of the, I was doing it in all caps too. One of my favorite gag now is whenever somebody is like, what's with the old caps and, and whatever. And then I'm like, my keyboard is broken. You caps lock privilege motherfucker. You know? And, <laughs> and uh, I love fucking with him on that. But it's, it's just one of those things where um, we believe what we read. Dude, it was, uh, I had this uh, nice uh, article I read from Psychology Today about this phenomenon, and I forget what it's called, but it's actually some psychological disorder, not unlike uh, Stockholm Syndrome, where people mm -hmm. now, because, you know, kids and, and even us, you know, we grew up in the internet generation, we think that people online are like our friends or our buddies, and we say, and, you know, that we would never say it to people in, in person. Right. Where we, wow. as we all know, it's like, it's just this persona of us that we project, but in our minds for some fucking reason, like we're emotionally attached to them and it's real. It's, it's weird. Cause I, I had so much fun with that aspect when I first got on social and I almost yeah. became more notorious for that versus my comedy. But then when I was really serious about wanting to get better at comedy and I looked at, well, these are the people that I look that I look to as like being the standard of, of being a good comedian. What are they doing that I'm not doing? I'm like, well, they're not getting in constant Facebook issues. Jeez. They're not, they're not behaving like that. And they're putting work in. I think we were both friends with uh, Brendan Lynch on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I think we were both really good friends with him. I ran into him. Uh, shit, I guess it was before my second brain surgery. I ran into him and it was hella funny. We were like, he, he kind of held back, you know, we were laughing and shit. Ben Duck Steel was there. And uh, it was just funny because he was kind of standoffish towards me. Mm -hmm. And then at some point he was like, man, like when I first met you, I don't know if you remember, but like you were a real dick to me on Facebook. And it was weird because he was like, he was hurt by that. You know what I mean? And I'm like, that's, that's what I mean. It's like, dude, that to me that, and to you, right? Like that, we know that's not real. He's like that's why we, we leverage it or we but did, he, you know, now we're that lie. Sure. I thought all he does is troll people. Right. That's, that's, right. that's and the thing is, is he's actually he's a very funny writer. He's a very funny. Yeah. He's a, I, I think uh, uh, our local comedian Mark Smalls has actually evolved what I thought was best about Brendan Lynch. Mark Smalls has taken it in that direction of being more of the likable jester of, right. of backhanded insults, because also he brings it back to himself. And Lynch, my favorite sets of his was doing that when he was more aloofly picking on people rather than in that that surly brow kind of like i need right. to fucking pick it's on funny people. it's funny you say that because so he i heard his feelings by whatever what? you know i heard his, shit i say I, I scare the shit out of him man so sensitive in that way right yeah. but then that night when i saw him uh he was a comedy show somewhere and there were these techies in the audience and it was four dudes sitting in a row mm. and he goes oh that's you guys are you guys with couples because everybody else was coupled up and he's like, oh, great. Uh, I get uh, four tech bros here in my show, and they're all the biggest fucking losers in San Francisco. <laughs> and it was funny, you know, just out of nowhere. But then it was also like, you will, like, straight up insult these people in public. Yeah. No, that's anything. And what's funny about <laughs> it is, like, there's, there's times where I've seen him do where it, it, 
it's it's just one of those things where I've I've just uh, you know my favorite guy who would, who did that. It's funny that people look to him as like oh he he's just brilliant and like no he's not brilliant because all of you motherfuckers don't think that Bobby Slayton is brilliant who is brilliant who was a guy who did that in the eighties when it when right. when it had its time and all this guy is doing is doing like the best of what Bill Burr did in in just you know would do just you know. Uh, you know, kind of just by second nature. And even right. he knew this is not something to build upon. And <laughs> I always said Lynch's Lynch, is, when you're, when your crowd work out, like is, is, is way stronger than your material, then that's, yeah, there's, there's, a, you know, that's not a good, I like, I like him. I like, I got a soft spot for him. I no, I, I, don't get me his, wrong. His material I, and whatnot. I though. like, I, here's the guy. I like Brendan Lynch when he is a, a truly, cool, humble dude, one-on-one. Yeah. -on -one. As soon as you add a third person in there, he becomes, the, he it's thinks true. he has to be somebody else. And he's, and he's, a, he's a chronic liar. He's a child. And uh, I, I still think his wife will divorce him uh, at some point. <laughs> I call, I'll put money on that shit too. Um, and it's, it's funny because he's sensitive about that. Like, yeah, I think that's I, on his mind dude, I because was, at, I, after the show, yeah. he was with all these dudes. He had all these dude fans, right? Yeah, of course. And I, 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 uh, like I went up to him and I was like, hey, bro, you got a lot of dude fans. And he looked at me really strange yeah. and he came up to me afterwards and he was like, hey, man, like, why'd you say, hey, you're getting a, You're going to get a divorce. Oh, he, he said misheard that? Me. He misheard me because of the noise. I said, hey, you got a lot of dude fans. I swear he, I haunt that motherfucker. I'll bet he still remembers me telling him I was drunk one night at my buddy's and this was when, cause I'm pretty sure him and a, another guy who I am friends with now better today. But, um, Lynch was behind a, a prank on me when they had my phone number and they were texting me from a number I didn't know, uh, trying to like, like basically, uh, really rip on me to try and get me to, to quit comedy. And, um, and I remember I took the number and I put it on blast on Facebook and all of my, all of my fucking misfit friends just tormented the fuck out of the number. And, uh, and I put during the exchange, we were having this back and forth and, and it was actually pretty fun too. And I, I said, you know what? This sounds a lot like Brendan Lynch, only Brendan Lynch is funny. And there was a pause in the rhythm of, of those exchanges because not only it's like, I, I not only insulted whoever this motherfucker was, but the pause was like, yeah, this is you. I, I'm figuring it out. And the reason why I, I know it was him was because uh, I went to do one of the showcases at Roosters that night, and he was there. He never would come up and talk to me. And on this night, for this first night ever, he walks up to me and goes, hey, how's it going? How's it going, me and Dave? And I, I just looked at him like, you know what the fuck is going on. <laughs> I, I'm like, I know exactly what you're fucking doing, man. And I wanted to beat his ass right then and there. And he's, he's taller than me. He's got reach and all that stuff. But he's a he's a 100 he's a sweetheart i'm a coward i'm a coward <laughs> no, he's not a sweetheart he's a coward he's a flat I know, coward. I know. i've had numerous people who are good friends with him point this out as well and uh and so the the thing about it was one night i was drunk and this is after like you know like a year later from all that shit or whatever and on a whim i was just like i'm gonna fucking troll the fuck out of brennan lynch and i just messaged him i'm like hey man uh you know just i just want to reach out to you and let you know if i were you I think your marriage really has a shot here. And, uh, and I think if I were you, I would just quit comedy and focus on having a good marriage. <laughs> and, uh, and that just started this whole night of instigating shit. And I'm drunk too. And I, but I'm, I mean, I remembered it all. I wasn't that drunk. I was drunk enough though, just to fuck with them. And I'm like, well, you know what you did. I'm like you guys fucking, you guys were all texting me or whatever. And this is how I know he did it because he contacted the other dude who was in on it with him because they were together when they were doing this shit. And that dude messaged me like, hey, what's what's going on? What are you doing with Brendan Lynch? Cause so, uh, so as soon as I knew, I'm like, these two did it. And I don't even ask. I, I'm so good friends with the with with the with the dude who was was and I, I he and I kind of got off on the wrong foot friendship wise. Now I'm one of his kind of his only friends after being through a bunch of shit. I don't like naming his name because he's he's a good dude and I don't want to fuck with him. But um, but the fact being, it was like, and Lynch is a cool dude. He gave me a ride home from a gig. And we had a great one-on-one -on -one conversation that night. And that's where I'm like, this is the dude I like, right. but you're, you're not, you're a sociopath, man. And you're, you're a sociopath who thinks he's pursuing, you don't even know what you pursue. You have no, you have no real vision or goals in what you're doing. You're just aimlessly do your people. He's people pleasing. And he thinks okay. he has to people please by being an asshole. 
And it's like, well, that, I, I think that also runs so in, in comedy. I've met a lot of people like that. Yeah, totally. In they, comedy. They, yeah. In that night when we were all hanging out, when me and him were talking by ourselves, it was all cool. But yeah, then when he, him and me and Ben got together, you know? Exactly. No, as soon as you get that third person in there, he thinks he has to be on. Fucking hate that shit. Well, everybody was like, I'm like, shit, can we just eat? Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, Ben yeah. was taking digs at me and then yeah. I'm it's digging. Put in your mouth and shut the fuck up, you know? <laughs> Can we be humans? Like, can we just yeah. be fucking humans? That's what I like about you, and I think that's why we get along. And you know, being it's fun. like we're humans. <laughs> it's it's no well. It's being. I had a boss. Uh, I used to work at a corn dog stand growing up, and and one of the things when he saw me getting into music, and I I I get what he meant now, but he used to he used to be like, "What are you doing this for?" And I'm like, "I because I love being creative. I like playing in bands. I never thought I'd be in a band." He goes, "Well, I, I mean, what is the goal to make money?" Because if you're not trying to make money at this, there's no point in doing it. And, and I, cause he used to work, uh, he was like, uh, one of the main guys who managed the LA forum back in like the sixties. And, uh, and he would tell me about like, you know, he worked with, he was a millionaire. He was a millionaire, lost all his money and then was a millionaire again. Like he's, he's one of these dudes that's just savvy with business. And he did the cord dog stand thing for fun because it was what helped get him back on his feet. And he just, it was one of his things that kind of kept him connected to, to, to reality. And, um, and I learned a lot from him cause he was like, kind of like a surrogate uncle figure of mine. Um, miss him. I don't, I don't, I mean, he last contacted me in 2009 and I wish there was a way to stay in touch, but he was never on social media and stuff. But, um, he, uh, he, one of the, th when he said that night was that there's, you know, that, that doing any of these kinds of things, it's like you, you, your goal should be to be successful at it or make, make something of it. And that, uh, it, to do anything for any other reason is, is just pointless. And I got him from the business standpoint, but what he didn't understand is from like the, the artistic standpoint of needing to express yourself. But I get his point now that really you should have some kind of mindset of like making something from this, but there's a way of making it. So you need to kind of make your own way versus kind of expecting something to do it for you. And that's where I think a lot of these people get into something thinking that like uh, they're just going to pick you out of the group. It's not like the, it used to be. And even back then, this is not a healthy model of like, yes, you're going to be a star. We're going to make you a star. Now, by the way, suck Joey Diaz's dick. You know, that, <laughs> that's kind of the world. That, Get in line. <laughs> and, that, and, that's, and that's, so it's like people are kind of like wondering, it's like, yeah, that's why people empower, you know, there's been, the, Jim Jeffries has that great episode of Legit where C Carrie Fisher is playing the executive who demands that she, you know, that he eat her out <laughs> to get it, to get gigs. It's so goddamn funny when it's flipped. Um, and then he thinks that Tom Arnold playing an executive who replaces her was doing the same thing. And then he's like, I don't, I don't want to do that, man. And then the guy <laughs> ends up freaking out the executive because that was not what he intended. Um, but the, the overall point of like, it, it's just, uh, I don't know. I, I, don't even, I think I lost my fucking point. How, yeah. how much of that do you think is like nowadays, you know, people uh, promote themselves online. You know what I mean? Yeah. So how much do you, do you think that is like, people kind of do expect that, right? Because, like, if I, I don't know, put up some comedy on YouTube or whatever, then I expect to get a lot of likes, and then eventually somebody will. It has to be good, and it has, you have to, I mean, because as far as, like, the, you can only promote so much, I feel like, on social media, and get it, it has to be attractive. It has to be some, there's a combination of factors. Oh, this is what my boss was telling me. It, it, he just said that, that for the most part, if you're going to do this, you want to, it's, it's better to be a real person who does, these things and not be some bullshit idea of yourself. Right. And that was what he told me about. And when it, and so I get, I asked what bands he worked with. He, he worked with all the greats. He's worked with the Beatles. He's worked with the doors. He's worked with Led Zeppelin. He worked wow. with, uh, it, and then, so I ran down the list. I'm like, well, who were like, who give me some examples of who were like real, just working guys. He goes, uh, he said the doors were working guys. I think he said Led Zeppelin were pretty much working guys. That's how I knew. And I said, what about Jimi Hendrix? And he said, Jimi Hendrix was an asshole. And I said, that makes sense because Jimi Hendrix is notoriously a bad businessman and, and was definitely kind of more of a, he was a rock star. Right. Um, and I'm sure these guys also had their rock star aspects to them. But the point being, it's like, is that they were, they were real people depending on that. And, and you don't see everybody at all times. So you don't really know. You, right, might, right. you might have a face of that and then you don't see like the one window of ego that they have. But, but yeah, if you do leave a, a trail of tears, it'll catch up to you. I think that's what happened with like Chris D'Elia recently and stuff. And, right. and, um, but then, then this mob just really, the funny thing is, is that this mob is just feeling the momentum of wanting to just sacrifice every, you know, anything that they can that has just a whim of, uh, of, of you know, in whatever improper behavior or whatever. And, uh, 
And, and I think coming from like, you know, the, the, the BLM movement and how much that's been online. And then here was the thing that I thought was really kind of odd. And I pointed this out to Nina G there was a, 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 a hashtag, uh, trending, uh, speaking out where women were taught, like spent, you know, Friday, this one Friday, uh, doing this hashtag of we're sharing stories of abuse and whatnot to like, mm. kind of, again, help support each other, which is great. However, it was happening on Juneteenth, uh, June 19th, which when I, when I was looking, I'm like, wait a minute, wasn't this the day that like <laughs> everybody now, all the wokeness is supposed to like be respecting this day that slavery mm. ended. And now the now and the the online like the trans community was standing in solidarity with black there, there's like, you know. so much and all it points to is like hey everybody what about me right. that's really what i i just can't can't it, because bottom line Which is the it, attitude that's why i have a problem with the the all lives matter thing because that's the attitude oh no, totally it's it, like it's, yeah black but, lives matter but like what about my life it, but and what's funny is that oddly enough the I think it speaks to that, you know, there's a little all lives matter in all of us. <laughs> you know? yeah. and, the, and the ones that that's where the performative allyship comes into play where that's right. why I even, I, I kind of have a joke. I, I might try to continue about how I was saying like, uh, you know, I'm all for the, the causes and in, in what the black lives matter movements about, but I got to say, it's made it a little awkward between me and my black friends that are just like, we're, 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 we're good. And I'm like, it's made me now sound like a dude who's insecure in his relationship where I'm like, uh, Hey, uh, are, are you okay? Is everything okay? Like, right. and, it's, and, that's uh, a super, that's become a super hack premise. Like oh, every God. black Thank comic you. I've seen so far. Thank you for calling like, me hack. So. No, no, not by you, not by you, by uh, black comedians. Like yeah. every black comedian I've seen in like the last three weeks. And I've been watching a lot of like local comedy. Yeah, they're like, oh, my white friends are calling me up, and they're yeah. like, are you okay? Yeah, exactly. And that's and that's so I, I'm just you're that the, white friend. I, yeah, I'm just the <laughs> other, I'm the 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 the, the non the, the person of color who's not white, I guess, but I am white too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, whatever. I've, I'm in that gray area of like, oh, we don't give a fuck about you, Dave. You're the one person of color that will always be treated like shit. So don't right. you, and you've earned it. so. But anyway. All right, we got to wrap this up, man. This has been long, and I know I got to edit this bullshit. So, uh, but it's but again, I think this is a good precursor to what we should be doing eventually. Uh, we may be doing either a spinoff, or maybe you should just join in the meantime with uh, with me and Dave. I don't fucking know. So we'll figure something out. Yeah. So I'm down whatever, whatever it is, whatever it is, whatever we spin off to, let's not call it the Burninator. The, How about uh, the Flaminator, bro? The Flaminator, maybe. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it was, it's a little I, gay. It's a little gay. <laughs> I don't know. There's got to be, uh, you know, hot man. I'm just fucking with you. Yeah, oh, I know you are. are. And I, I, okay. It's good. We'll figure. We'll we'll brainstorm. We'll figure something out. But I think these are good conversations. This is definitely already uh, uh, heads and tails better than what I figured we would. I I was picturing more of us just looking at each other. We're like, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> well, I don't know. So no, actually, doing the. Um... Uh, ear, you and Eerie's podcast and or uh, whatever the fuck this is, face cast. Zoom it's, cast. Uh, yeah, it's the live <laughs> live podcast on Zoom. Uh, no, it, it's like it's made it easier. Like I need a little experience because remember the first one I did, it was like I was like kind of waiting to talk and shit because I'm like, I don't, do I go in? Yeah, well, that was the podcast podcast. Okay. That was when we were just doing the podcast and, and oh, right, right. The, we're, we've, uh, I, I feel like we've really gotten I learned it this last week. I, I actually uh, messaged Gary and gave, gave her like a kind of an apology of sorts and, and a, a shout out of like how, how I learned both cause we both took a week off of the show cause we had just some things going on. And, um, but I learned that like with, with having you guys on, you guys were great by the way. But what I also realized is just how much I'm like, I get, because people have said like, wow, you and Erie have a great chemistry on things. I'm like, do we really? Because I always feel like we're, we're like a brother and sister who like are kind of, you know, have each other. Each other. Yeah. And, uh, but when I, when we did it without her, what I realized, I'm like, she does, there is something that I have been taking for granted. And I gave her that message. And then we also had to hash out some things financially because she wasn't telling me that like the zoom, the, some of the stuff that was doing, she was coming out of pocket for. And I was mm -hmm. like, are you kidding? Like take, take money off the top of our tips to, help pay for the for for uh, the expenses of doing of running the shit which uh which it helped completely and i shot her some money for from what we made before and um yeah because it's just like kind of like you know she her primary concern was our comedians i'm like the comedians will be taken care of trust me 
right. and the ones that we're trying to help because like we there's ones i try to help that i know are like more on hard times and there's ones that i know are completely like you that you know you work and you're willing to you know be of service in comedy as well as you know mm -hmm. as well as donate yourself and um but I, and i i you know this is my living so i've been technically living off of it but even i have been like you know having to make sure it's like no i take care of these people and know where i'm that you know kind of having that balance so I mean, right. I and that makes it. sense because anytime like you're putting in something has come out of the pocket it it makes the weight a little bit more yeah no and, it, and it's i mean it's like if you can afford to do that yeah that's fine and right. she said the thing was is comedy when she was doing her comedy gigs that would all like she was making enough money at it to help to, to break even or maybe make a little more money in terms of uh, the production of like the podcast stuff and, and what became the zoom stuff. And, uh, and I just said, it was just good to, it just boils down to communication. Right. All this shit just boils down to communication. And, and that's what I've, I've learned primarily in recovery is, you know, it's not just talking, but listening, you know, and asking and making sure to, to make bridge that gap. That's what a lot of this, I, I saw a great post by a comedian friend, Megan Roth, uh, she's a comedian uh, from Iceland who lived here for a while when she was younger and started in comedy. And she had a great post uh, about dealing with uh, the, what the going on of sexual harassment and sexual assault currently. And she told some stories uh, that involve some people that I know too, um, just to illustrate though uh, an example of where she was in a place where she clearly wasn't safe and made not to feel safe after that she kind of found herself in. Uh, another time where someone did something and the steps she took to address it and how it actually came back and the guy actually learned something from it and, and has benefited from that communication. And again, it boils down to communication. And right. that's kind of what she was illustrating too. And also pointing out that, that, you know, she has, it was one of the things that you don't see in a lot of this call out culture is introspection. And it, it, because it's hard to, where it's like no victim should ever, you know, that's where we get into all the don't victim blame. Well, it's like, Granted, yes, you don't want yeah. to make blame, but we we it's it's understanding. Do I have a level of accountability here? Right. But you know, if you you are a pedestrian, you have the right of way. Does that mean that if you go trying to cross a freeway, knowing full well that it's a freeway, right? Are you are you complicit in some level of your own injuries if you get hit by a car? And also, just like if you could make that outcome better, yeah. If you have some power to do that, why would you not? Yeah. And, and, I, and it's, and it's, and that's really what her primary thing was. It's like, you know, being a victim doesn't mean that you, that you need to keep, keep, you know, victimizing yourself in many respects and all that and exploit it really. It's exploitive. And, uh, because that, that again, it garners more sympathy when we see people that are really trying to, 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 you know, grow from it. And, and it sucks that we, you know, sometimes it takes trauma to, to, to grow from all this fucking shit and nobody should have to do it, but it, it's it sucks that it's it's part of reality and, and I, I have I, like there's been a lot of my women friends who've told me about experiences like this and i'm like well what do you what do you say to the guy like when he made some inappropriate comment and they're like oh nothing and i'm like because they're and, 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 right, and, and, rightfully totally so too. totally and again not to say that it was their fault by any not means, at all but right? yeah if they could speak up and yeah. be able to get that courage like it would make those guys learn something yeah because no, at the end of the day, when they you know say, "Hey, nice ass," and they just like shrink away, mm -hmm. the guy's like, "Oh, I can keep doing that." Mm -hmm. No, and that's what she was kind of illustrating was a position where she wasn't. Also, she's a young girl, and the trouble was is it's like, yeah, if you would have told me those those were the comics you were rolling with, I would have told you not to go. And it's not right. because I thought so badly. I mean, I, I have my thoughts, but it was more just like you won't be you you won't be safe it, 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 when when push comes to shove. And I was watching because I was friends with her, but also. I'm not, I'm not any, you know, I'm not her dad. I'm not any of those kinds of things. And I, it, but it was like, and I do, you know, I, I do get hit up and stuff and I've, I've been able to, you know, I, I, if anything, all I know is I look at these people as coworkers and even the ones that I've been good friends with where I've expressed interest, like not interest in dating, but like, Hey, yeah, you're attractive and all that kind of stuff. I leave it at that. And, and not to say like, Oh, I couldn't date any of them or whatever. It's just, I haven't found anybody where I'm like, do I really want to like, even if this were really a possibility, there's definitely times where, yeah, maybe I would have, but I also look back and it's like, ah, it's better that I did. And uh, I don't think I've ever like. There's something about like because you you hooked up with comedians and I even asked you about it. And well, I'm like, there was I'm there was one I didn't. There was there was one I hooked up with and that was fucking weird as hell. I've that only hooked up with one two myself. I mean, I've dated uh, a couple too, but I, we never went further than just making out and 
and it was all about board. <laughs> yeah, I got penetration. I don't like to brag. Yeah, but... well, so did I. And, I. and I've even, I've even discussed. Uh, I'm friends with them too to this day. So that's we're lucky. I, th- I think we're friends. It was a little awkward. This was the one that I tell you that I said uh, as I was nesting a butt. I was like the archer uh, back. No, I was like that. Yes, that I did actually say that. But also, I said I love you. Oh yikes. Whoa. Yeah, and not not like not meaning I love you, but just like I it was such a good feeling. Yeah. Passion. Oh, I love you. I was like, oh, I fucking love you. And she's yeah, like, exactly. what? Yeah. And uh, we had we haven't. I don't think we really talked since. <laughs> That's the same person that I that I I know about. Yes. yes. Well, that that person unfortunately is, is dealing with has been gaslit all the hell by an awful person, and is still dealing with the fallout of it. There was actually a recent incident with that person. So yeah, and, uh, tell you know, me about it offline. <laughs> Prayers go out to her. I'll put it that way. So. No, I, I hate seeing that. But and on, on a good, let's end on a prayers go out to everybody in all of these fucking things uh, before we get ourselves caught up into too much uh, cancel cancellation of, of my fifty viewers. Uh, but yeah, thanks, man. Another, another uh, been another checking in with the meantime, and we'll be back to you. I'm free, I'm free, I'm free.